these are the retailers at a certain size that yeah. have invested into a data team, analysts, etc. They're yeah. very used to working and they have control over their first party data. Yeah. Right? So all the internal data first, yeah. they know how to leverage that. And now they're looking to overlay with what we call third party data, like external yeah. data. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm, LFH IQ. Data is everywhere, but to be able to effectively use it, you need to understand their sources, limitations, and how you might be able to fill up gaps in your internal data with externally available data sets. The lifeblood of retail business runs on finding the right sites. But doing that is not easy because of the unavailability of the right data sets to understand consumer behavior. So how to identify the right data sets for retail planning? In today's episode, our guest Thomas Wally discusses retail data sets and how they can be used for retail operational planning. He also describes the sources of different data sets and their limitations. Finally, he touches on different use cases and where retailers are getting the most value from data sets currently available in the market. Let me introduce Thomas to you. A compelling speaker and thought leader, Thomas possesses a wealth of expertise on topics such as data-driven decisions, competitive intelligence, data quality, macro trends, and cross-cultural business expansion. His company, Unicast, success story mirrors his pursuit of enhancing products and strategies through real-world location data insights. He is not just a leader, but a trailblazer, fostering a culture of data-driven decision-making and innovation that resonates throughout the industry. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hello, hey, Thomas. Welcome to the show. Hey, Sam. Good to be here. Yeah, and I'm super excited. Uh, always uh, talking to my retail uh, friends is always fun, especially when it comes to planning and the kind of work that you do, especially in the site selection space. It's always fascinating for me, anything that is going to be data driven. So I'm going to have a lot of fun personally. Okay, just to kick things off, if my listeners might not know you, do you want to start with your quick intro as well as what you're focusing on these days? Yeah, sure. So uh, quick story is that... Um... I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Unicast, and we help retailers make better data-driven decisions. So what do I mean by that? I mean, yeah. how can retailers understand how their customers are moving around on the planet? Like what stores do the customers go to? Yeah. If the customer is a certain, visiting a certain location, what is this, their demographic? Yeah. Uh, where did they come from? How far did they travel? Yeah. What we really try to solve for real estate, excuse me, for retail is yeah. retailers know a lot about what's happening inside their stores, yeah. right? The transaction yeah. data, what shelves they're at, there's a lot of technology solving that. But the second the customer leave their store, okay. they're pretty much in the, in the dark. Okay. And that is what we help them understand so that that can improve their business operations. Everything from merchandising to staffing yeah. to marketing campaigns yeah. as well as around site selection, right? Like okay. where to open up your next your your next store. Yeah. And where should that be in the city or in the county or the state that you wanna wanna grow? Yeah, so very interesting. And I'm going to peel a lot of layers there. I think there are some topics that I would definitely like to dig further into before we do that. We have one of these standard questions that we ask every single guest. And that is going to be your perspective on business growth. Yeah. That's a big question, uh, Sam. It's you a big question. Kind of a, <laughs> you can kind of put a lot of kind of uh, lo, lo, lot of topics into business growth, but I'm kind of looking at it from 
I think the kind of growth is what you want to get to, right? And yeah. the question is, how do you get growth? Like, how do you see growth happening? Yeah. I think it's really hard to say, I like, wake up in the morning and say, we want to grow. Like, you want to look at grow. Okay, you want to grow. <laughs> Keep chanting in the morning, that. you'll grow one of these days, right? <laughs> right. So, so I think it's more about kind of what you need to do in order to yeah. go and yeah. to not kind of focus on the kind of obvious sales needs to go up and marketing needs to kind of do, uh, do well. One of the things that I've seen that's correlated very well with growth is momentum. Okay. Right. Like, how does the company see momentum? Okay. And I think this this is a very underestimated part of building a company because okay. when you're building a company in yeah. an industry, there's so many external factors okay. that you are less in control of. Yeah. It can be the market dynamics, it can be yeah. the clients, it can be the yeah. customers, but and of course you have to manage those aspects care- carefully. Yeah. But what we are very much in control of is what kind of momentum do we want to have? And I can talk all about the down to the, like the, the day-to-day actions, right? Yeah. Like how does a startup keep that momentum by having yeah. quick conversations and getting to quick conclusions yeah. so that they can move forward? In this kind of example, I'm not kind of taking for granted that you have a strategy uh, set up, but that momentum piece, we have to think about that's what we are in control of. Okay. Um, and especially when you work with, you can kind of look at this from an external perspective, clients, yeah. right? Like how, Quickly, do you get back to your clients? How yeah. quickly do you do you kind of progress the sales conversation yeah. conversation through the through the pipeline? Yeah, all that builds momentum, and yeah. that momentum, when successful, creates growth. So I kind of link very much momentum and growth yeah. very tightly to, together. Okay, so very interesting. So I need some more details there on uh, momentum, and I don't know if this is some sort of KPIs that you have seen that you define in your tool. That could be a possibility. But number one, define what is momentum for you. And I don't know if this is going to be some sort of SQ velocity. Some people uh, refer to that, uh, or any sort of velocity from the sales perspective. Those could be. I mean, there could be several different layers. So number one, define. Yeah. Number two, if this is some sort of official KPI, how do you quantify that yeah so let's talk about the more obvious right that is measurable and you can talk about the sales process how to keep momentum through the sales process i think it matters how quickly you get back to your prospect that um submits a request on your website and want to talk talk to you does it take 50 minutes for you to get back to them by email or do you Mm -hmm. do it the next day yeah Uh, when you kind of start having those conversations like how quickly do you get the first meeting set up when you get the second meeting set up, do you spend two days getting back to the client or uh, prospect on certain questions, yeah. right? All those things can be carefully monitored in different sales tools and CRM tools, et cetera. Uh, so you have kind of many different, like the time from first touch to first first meeting. Like we have mapped out our sales process very diligently, dil- dil- diligently and like, yeah. like mapping every single yeah. step and seeing how long time it takes. and. Yeah. With so much kind of great AI tools, tool, tools now, we use using Gong extensively to like understand how can we speed up the sales process? Because yeah. usually, here's the good thing. Usually, if you get an inbound lead and those yeah. are the best, best business to get, those are pretty much in a buying mode. You're yeah. looking to have a problem solved right now. Yeah. And I'm always thinking, okay, we are up against competition. The ones that can kind of move that prospect passes through the sales process and give yeah. them confidence that they are the right vendor, yeah. they will eventually win. So the the sales KPI or the sales velocity KPIs yeah. um, is a very good way to define momentum. The other part, which is slightly less tangible, yeah. um, is what kind of culture do you build around momentum? Yeah. And, and that's there's ways to track it, ways to measure it, but usually yeah. not not done in that kind of sophisticated way. Yeah. But that is we, I'm always thinking about we have external clients yeah. that want answers. We also have internal clients or stakeholders okay. in the company that need other people's reply in order for them to succeed yeah. on their jobs. Yeah. So you see this this part that I mentioned, like how quickly are we getting back to each other yeah. as an organization? Yeah. How quickly are we getting to a decision? Yes. I can promise it, and you're probably saying this yourself, is that like, some things we spent two weeks on getting to yep. a conclusion. We knew that we had sometimes two years. <laughs> exactly, and that is more that, that is more a mindset thing, right? Like, how do you try to break out of that? Yeah, we'll figure that out next week. Yeah, make a decision, 
and move on, right? Like that is what creates momentum, even though the, the decision is wrong, right? Yeah. Because then you can co- co- course correct very quickly. Yep. Yeah. So very interesting. So one of the things that you mentioned uh, is Gong, and I don't know if you're using their data as well as part of your platform. If I ask Gong, obviously what I'm going to get is probably their sales pitch. So now yeah. I am interested in knowing how you are utilizing Gong in your space. Do you have any sort of use cases? Do you get any sort of data? Maybe I don't know if you are trying to correlate with the momentum. Is that what you are trying to do with your customers? So maybe touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So different parts of our organization uses Gong for different reasons. Yeah. Um, and you have, of course, like the sales team is using Gong to help coach uh, yeah. the sales team. And like you should have approached this conversation a bit differently. That will yeah. have maybe kind of help them move to the next step or move to the next step faster. Yeah. Uh, you see the marketing team is kind of really listening in on Q words so they can kind of tie yeah. the next marketing campaigns more to the challenges that the prospect is, is yeah. facing. From my perspective, I'm using it a lot to... Like how can I be in the sales meeting without being in the sales sales meeting? Yeah, right? yeah. Like how can I be close to the prospects and really hear what they are struggling with? Um, it's hard for an executive to be in that many sales meetings at the same time, but I love to listen in to listen to the client's needs. Like okay. that is very much what kind of fuels our strategy and how we think about product development tied to marketing efforts, tied to sales uh, stra- strategy. So that is... That's where I see the most value in my role as a CEO to be able to be in 10, 15 sales meetings yeah. uh, in a week uh, without actually being physically there. So interesting. So for people who might not be familiar with Gong, so maybe describe in a couple of sentences, you know, what can they expect? Let's say if they might not be utilizing Gong at this point of time. Uh, is it some sort of call record, recording platform where you are getting some sort of data that you are utilizing for decisions? So, so tell us a little bit more. What is it? Yeah. And I love how we're making a commercial for uh, Gong here, right? That, Sorry. <laughs> uh, it happens. No, great tools. Uh, there serves a shout out. But like Gong is literally like a plugin that you can plug into, into Zoom that will record yeah. your uh, conversation with the yeah. prospect, yeah. Uh, which enables others to listen to that conversation after. Plus, you also have the possibility to get a transcript so you can read what was said and told. Okay. And you can also ser- search in that tra- transcript or conversation for certain keywords. So you can kind of search for pricing. Now you get everything that people said about pricing. Or yeah. if there are, if the deal is competitive, right? you can also kind of search for what did the prospect say about the com- competition. So it's just a way to like get really data-driven insights uh, about a sales conversation. And, they have a bunch of other features that we haven't started using yet, but um, it's definitely something that I recommend uh, to most companies. Okay, so very interesting. So since this is uh, this conversation is really about data, so obviously this data is going to be really meaningful and seems like mm-hmm. you are probably not using this data for your retail decisions. But if I go back yeah. to the conversation, some of the things that you mentioned is, uh, you know, people leaving the store. And that is something that I have not heard before. But with retail, the more information that you are going to have about your consumer, the better it is going to be. Typically, in my mind, when I look at or when I speak to any of my retail friends, obviously, they have the beacon technologies and they are sort of uh, trying to track the movement and they are trying to replicate the same funnel that you are going to have in the e-commerce space, uh, which is great. But I mean, tell us Mm -hmm. what all different data sets are available for the physical uh, store planning. And let's say if some of the retailers might not be utilizing those, how can they get access to those data sets? Right. So we focus solely on location data and insights. Okay. So location and insights means how people are connected to places. Okay. So how are people moving around? Yeah. And it comes from kind of what I previously said that yeah. how can a retailer understand more about their consumers, their prospects, yeah. their customers? Yeah. In the same way, to your point, how they understand their customers in the e-commerce world. Yeah. Like tons of data, right? They know yeah. every single interest yeah. and they kind of hunt them down until they buy that thing that they left in the, yeah. in the cart. So we kind of build a, a very unique data set from location data signals, from cell phones and yeah. apps and telcos yeah. globally yeah. Yeah. that allows us to build insights that, to give you a couple of examples, you can say, okay, how many people are visiting this particular location? Okay. What time and day is the food traffic the highest, the least? Very okay. relevant for for, for staffing, for instance, 
Um, and then you can look at okay, this particular retail stores. The big question a lot of retailers have is like, where did my customers come from? Yeah. Like, are they local? Yeah. Did they travel far? Yeah. Um, and that kind of usually helps them inform their marketing decisions. Yeah. Because now they know what kind of, this is the term trade area, right? Like yeah. people that are going to the store, like where do they come from? Are there areas like neighborhoods where I don't have high adoption? Should I kind of do more marketing towards mm-hmm. that part yeah. of the of, of the city? Um, and it's, it's also about understanding the competitive window. I think this is where physical stores have a disadvantage because you can't really know where did a customer go before or after yeah. they went to Sam Gupta store, right? Yeah, yeah. We can help them understand, well, if they went to your your, your store shortly after, they went to uh, another competitor uh, of yours. And we've seen these amazing use cases with our clients where we had one client, for instance, where they saw this kind of recurring theme that customers visited their store first, yeah. but then many of them went to a competitor afterwards. Okay. But it was this kind of pattern of like, Huh. That, that, that means that they're not getting everything at their store. So they had to kind of think about their sortiment and like their merchandise, like, hey, what are what are we missing? And so they did kind of a lot of deep analysis and yeah. found out what products were they missing in their stores. But yeah. it was that first kind of link seeing that, hey, yeah. there's a high number of customers visiting our store first, but yeah. then going to a competitor. Huh. The conclusion was that we are missing some products that they should be getting. Uh, in our store. Very interesting insights there. So I definitely want some more details there. And it's fascinating the way you are describing this, because in my mind, let's say if I think about this, if I go to Nike and if I'm buying a product from Nike, uh, you know, I'm not going to use me as the example. My wife is probably a better example. Okay. Mm. And that's, she's probably the best proxy for a shopper because I'm a terrible shopper. You know, you don't Mm. want me to be a shopper, to be completely honest. Okay. So she's far more informed by a better proxy for a shopper. The reason for that is because the way she is going to behave is she's going to go to one store. Obviously, Mm. the next thing she's going to do is she is actually going to go to a competing store. And the reason for that mm. is because she's trying to check out how many different deals are available, <laughs> you yeah. know, because if you are buying Nike, Nike, Reebok, you know, uh, mm. all of those competitors are going to have probably fairly similar offering. Uh, I mean, yeah. I can see some people that are going to be super loyal to a brand, uh, but most people in my mind would be slightly more price sensitive if yeah. you talk about the general market. So that's a very fascinating example. Now. In that example, I need to know more. Okay, so when you talk about this data that you are able to do all of this, and I spend some time in the the data business as well. And in data business, the way this works is, you know, it's all about source of the data. Okay, so I don't know if you are able to provide some more insights into where this data is coming from. How are you able to draw these trends? I think that will be meaningful if you are able to provide that. Yeah, so the the kind of the key source of our insights comes from different types of location data signals. Okay. And this is location data signals from cell phones and apps, from telcos. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's basically at its rawest form, it's just like a dot on a map. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we just like, there's a dot on this map, but there's yeah. no context yeah. to yeah. it. So this is where we, we have an amazing data science team in the US and in Norway and in Czech Republic that really takes all these dots and kind of builds models that can tell us, okay, was a person standing still? Yeah. uh, What uh, were they moving? And like, we we aggregate all this up, right? So we kind of, the output is the number of people. Yeah. um, And we layer in maps and point of interest data. So we can kind of understand, hey, this Nike store saw X number of visits. Yeah. But that's just one part of the data piece. So like the location signals is kind of the core. But what's interesting to know is also the demo data, like the yeah. age and the gender and yeah. the education. Yeah. Like that's another part that the yeah. retailers are very much in the dark. It's like, okay, yeah. who visits my store or yeah. who is not visiting? And how does that stack against my com- competition? Yeah. We also layer in another data set, uh, like psychographic data okay. uh, from one of our partners, Spatial AI. And that goes much deeper because psychographic data talks more about what kind of consumer are you. Yeah. If you have consumers, like you have, you have two buckets, you have like male 35 to 45, yeah. this education, this age, 
they can be like very different, right? You can, you can have some that are like super sporty, less sporty, someone that is very much into fashion, less into into fashion. Yeah. So it kind of it's all about kind of drilling deeper down from number of people to a certain location to like what more can I tell about them? Yeah. To inform site selection and retail operations and marketing campaigns. Okay, so very interesting insights there. So I'm definitely going to have some more questions there, I guess. Okay, so number one, obviously, you know, as you correctly pointed out, that this is going to be really at the aggregate level. Because if you are going to do at the person level, then you are probably going to get into privacy issues in the US or Canada or North America, for that matter. The privacy issues are not going to be as much, but in Europe, I guess you have far more problems, I guess, uh, you know, but in your case, let's say if you're trying to correlate all of these data sets, uh, you have to correlate based on something, right? So even though the information that you have available is going to be at the aggregate level, but to be able to understand that a person leaves from the store and it goes to the next store. So are you trying to correlate this based on the phone number, email, is it age? Because age is not going to give you the real insights, to be completely honest. Okay, it's probably going to be misleading, I guess. So yeah. how are you able to do this without getting into privacy issues? Yeah, so there are, there's many ways that you can do that. And yeah. I think that the privacy piece, it's um, you can overcome it and you can kind of act within kind of the realm of um, how data should be collected and processed yeah. and utilized. But a lot of the retail insights that we focus on, it usually yeah. kind of ties into a certain neighborhood or ties into a certain census okay. block, right? So you have public available data that says in this census block, people yeah. that live there yeah. has a certain income, average income, uh, okay. a certain age. And that tells you a lot when you have that data at scale, yeah. that tells you a lot about if you have like 15 different census blocks that are all kind of drawing people to yeah. your location, yeah. you can get a very kind of good view of what kind of demographics are you pulling. And the same kind of goes with the psychographic uh, psychographic data. Yeah. So there's many ways to do this in a very in a privacy friendly way. Yeah. Uh, because we're all only focusing on the aggregated yeah. insights. Yeah. And it's also here, here's kind of one miscon misconception that I see a lot that when you want to use data to make better decisions, and yeah. that's kind of how we help our our clients. Yeah. It's important that the data is directionally correct. Uh, yeah. Correct and yeah. relevant. Yeah, it doesn't have to be like a like spot on down to like fifth yeah. decimal point, or I agree. It has to be like directionally correct, yeah. and you're able to see trends yeah. over time. Yeah. Um, and we have just spent a lot of time educating our clients. Yeah. On that, like as an example, many clients say, "Hey, do you have real real time data?" Yeah. And our question back is always, "What do you need real time data for?" And then it's, "No, well, we don't really need real time data." Okay, yeah. great. Here's the other options that 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 you can use. Yeah. So I think kind of the the use case you're trying to solve for, like site selection, for instance, like what is the best data set? Yeah. At what frequency? Yeah. Uh, and, and at what granularity helps yeah. solve that for you? Okay, so very interesting. So census data, I'm completely with you. Makes sense. Um, you know, that will be so useful for the site selection. And in my mind, that will be slightly more traditional model, right? Uh, because uh, yeah. in, that data must be available for most retail retailers. Now, what mm. you are really able to do, to, to be completely honest, is you are able to overlay uh, your location data on top of that, which is what makes it powerful. And that's how you are able to draw these trends when a person is moving from one store to the next store. And these are really fascinating insights where you can do crazy things yeah. uh, from the marketing yeah. perspective. So my question is, I mean, see here, I am sensing a little bit of leap. And I don't know if my listeners are going to be with me or not. So, you know, from the census data, combining this location data, how are we getting to the sophisticated use cases? I don't know how much insight you can provide, but if you can provide some more context there for listeners to be able to understand how this is happening so that they can utilize for their use cases, I guess. Yeah, so a very kind of typical use case that we help a lot of companies with is site selection. Yeah. You mentioned it, right? Yeah. And it's if you are a growing brand, either you're a restaurant or a yeah. retailer or a QSR, okay, you're looking to expand another 50 locations. Now you have a mass investments to make, and we know that making the right location versus the wrong location is kind of a make it or break it. So this is where we help our clients to identify what is the right location. Yeah. Like what is the location that they will see the maximum uh, revenue 
And there's many factors to look at. And this is why I'm going to like talk a bit about the, the different types of insight that help drive that, that, is, that decision. Yeah. So first of all, right, you, you could say, what are the locations? And let's say that your real estate broker has come up, up and said, in this city, you have 15 vacant locations that's on the corner of an intersection. Like that yeah. is one of your requirements, yeah. right? You're going to pick two of those 15. Yeah. Then the question is, what of those locations has the most foot traffic? Yeah. And right, more more foot traffic leads to more sales. Yeah. You might think. Yeah. However, of that foot traffic, does that foot traffic fit into your demographic profile of the people that you are looking to address? Right. So if you have, let's say, like a cafe for like the younger part of the population. Yeah. Is this a location that kind of attracts the younger, or is this a location that attracts more of the mid forties, fifties, etc. Yeah. Right. So not all, not only the amount of foot traffic is important, but also like what type of foot traffic. Yeah. Okay. I think now you've narrowed down your scope from like fifteen locations to maybe like six. So let's then not look at only the location, but let's look at the neighborhood. Yeah. Right. So this cafe is these kind of five locations that you are left at. Um, yeah. How is the neighborhood? performing yeah and this is where we can kind of zoom a bit out now we're not yeah. looking at the particular store but now we're looking at the neighborhood around is this a vibrant neighborhood do we yeah. see that food traffic in general for your demographic is increasing yeah. or decreasing um one aspect that we have seen a lot in the last few years is the shift of some neighborhoods going from a lot of residents uh, or residential uh, pedestrians to workers and vice versa. So places that used to be uh, with a lot of people that live there are now being turned into more like office. Yeah. Especially as you see the suburbs, right, where offices in the suburb is growing because of people are uh, working from uh, from home. So I mentioned now like three of the key insights. There's another yeah. kind of skew of other things that help you make these data driven decisions. But everything from the foot traffic, how much into the is this the right foot traffic for you? Does this draw your right audience to yeah. Is this location in the neighborhood that I expect to see grow and be vibrant and yeah. that I can grow with? Okay, so very interesting. So I am going to ask some more layers there just to understand, you know, how this is working. And I'm actually trying to play a rookie data scientist here, I guess. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's say for the location data that you mentioned, that might be coming from MLS data, I guess, from the real estate perspective. They generally have that data available. So most likely, um, you are probably trying to overlay this with, uh, you mentioned telco data, and I don't know what kind of data sets are available from the telco perspective when you are going to have, are they able to correlate? Obviously, they are not going to provide you, okay, mobile number, Sam Gupta's mobile number, you know, he was here. It doesn't work that way, right? So they must be providing, probably, are they providing more of the um, demographic or psychographic data, or what are the, what, what are the allowed, I guess? Uh, to sell yeah so so it's a bit of kind of to distinguish like we have two product lines where the telco data and the work we do with telcos and the nordics and uk and latam is it's a different set of products so i would not kind of tie that telco data into the retail per se now interesting Uh, this is where kind of telco data we're using a lot of telco data and helping those telcos better understand traffic flows for instance like what what roads are people traveling on the most to get into a city? And we're doing like big projects with um, railroad systems, right? Yeah. To understand if people are going on the train at a certain station, where do they jump off? Surprisingly, yeah. the trains doesn't really know that information themselves. So we can kind of like box the telco out for like different yeah. types of use cases, really exciting use cases, understand human mobility. But when it comes to retail, yeah. this is about kind of understanding the location data signals with the dem- demographic data. We even kind of layer in wet- uh, weather data, right? Because weather data is a very good proxy to understand uh, people movement. If it's rain, if it's cold, that it impacts food traffic data everywhere in the, in the world. Okay, so very interesting. So tell us a little bit more about the industry and I don't know how new your offering is and how much, let's say, you know, I don't know who your target buyer is going to be, but my understanding is going to be the store managers probably would be utilizing this data or maybe the operations manager who might be overseeing them, they might be buying this data, right? So from their perspective, I mean, they typically, in my experience, when 
I interact with them, even though they might be very savvy in business, they are not as technology savvy in general. So do they understand data? Are they utilizing it right now? I don't know how many competitors you have. Is this a new offering? So maybe tell us the the state of the industry right now. Yeah. So I think and I think I would split the industry in two. I would split it into the one and let's call those the sophisticated buyers. These are the retailers at a certain size that yeah. have invested into a data team, analysts, etc. They're yeah. very used to working and they have control over their first party data. Yeah. Right. So all the internal data first. Yeah. They know how to leverage that. And now they're looking to overlay with what we call third-party data, like external yeah. data sets like what U- Unicast offers. Yeah. And for that set of buyer that they kind of know what they're looking for, what yeah. they value is what is the quality of the data? Yeah. How reliable is this data? How easy is it to plug the Unicast data into yeah. their data lake and into their dashboards, et cetera? Yeah. yeah. So that is, and that is, that's a market that is growing because yeah. more, I mean, more retailers today, the large one definitely, but also kind of the medium and the small ones are realizing yeah. that they have to have these internal data capabilities. Yeah. So that's that's kind of one one piece of the puzzle. But then to your point, you also have retailers that have not come that far yet. Yeah. It could be because of lack of sophistication and focus. Mm-hmm. It could also just be because of lack of size. They don't they 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 can't afford to hire a five to ten people data scientist team, right? Yeah. So this is where we have built dashboards, yeah. right? So this is all that valuable data, all the insights is now available in a dashboard. Yeah. So you don't need to have any data competence or any analyst on your team. Yeah. You can basically go into the into the dashboard. You can search for your location, your competitor's location, and then you get like a set of metrics and insights yeah. that help you make these data driven decisions. So we kind of cater for both those because we see that it's the underlying insights. Yeah. It's all the same. It's more like, hey, how do they access this? Yeah. By a data data feed, by yeah. an API, or do yeah. they get this through a, a nicely visualized dashboard? Okay. So very interesting. So, you know, I definitely need some more details there in terms of the purchase cycle, I guess, right? So let's say if anybody's coming to you and I don't know if this insight is going to be dependent upon their first party data or can they use your product standalone? Those two Mm -hmm. possibilities could be there. Now, if if you have to use their first party data, then obviously you need to overlay this before you can hand it over to them. So overall, in terms of the delivery, how does it look like? Are you, let's say, selling CSV files uh, or are you selling API access? Uh, Are you selling subscription? Give us Mm -hmm. the the whole uh, process, I guess, in terms of, let's say, if I'm the retailer and I'm trying to utilize data set, obviously, I may have some first party data. It may be really, really bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. And, and I think that we, we don't usually kind of take on board the retailer's first party data because like that is theirs. Yeah. They're rather looking to kind of join their first party data with of their data sources to enrich mm-hmm. the data. And what we have seen is that these retailers want to access data in many diff- different ways. So we have yeah. had to cater to be able to be able to offer this to your point as a CSV file, yeah. as a data dump on a S3 bucket, yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. We offer this to an API if you want to kind of pull certain locations at your own uh, cadence. Yeah. So there's that's kind of the top three ways that our clients are consuming the data. Yeah. And then you also get the dashboards, right? So you're going to see how the how the data is coming to life. And even in some some of the, our clients in the retail organization, you might have some that benefit from, from the data, right? And that might be the analytics team. Uh, it might be kind of the marketing team that is used to work with data, but then you might have some ops teams, maybe the executives that don't have time for that. They just want to see the same thing yeah. in a dashboard. So yeah. the, the whole kind of key here is how can we be as flexible as uh, possible? Yeah. Uh, and how can we make sure that the retailers can can get access to these insights at their preferred uh, platform or their preferred way. Very interesting. So in your engagements, when you go, uh, you are obviously selling to retailers and I'm pretty sure there are other data companies that are trying to sell most likely complementary offerings, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So this is going to be really site selection. I don't know if you guys do uh, some other things, for example, let's say price benchmarking, Mm -hmm. that is going to be a big deal for retailers in general, right? Uh, There are other things. I mean, if it is going to be a really big retailer, 
then they are looking for things such as your comp, uh, you know, benchmarking. So it could be all over the place in terms of the external data that they are going to be needing. So overall, in your experience, what are different data sets available? I don't know if you work closely with these companies and go to market together, but maybe describe some of the data sets that are kind of must have for retailers in 2024. Oh, good, good question. Yeah, I think kind of we have decided to like, hey, we want to be good at one thing. Yeah. And, and I think this is where it's really hard to be good at many, many things. Yep. Uh, and Especially in data business. Ask, <laughs> exactly. And if you ask me some mornings, I want to like let go all types of uh, data sets. That would be the richest solution to our yep. our clients. But we want to be really good at understanding location data yep. and location intelligence. We focus only on that. Like yep. that is the value that we bring in. Yeah. But I think it, it's hard to disconnect location data from demographic data. Yeah. So that is why we could we kind of put in demographic data as part of our uh, our uh, offering. Yeah. I think your question, what kind of data set does the retailer need today? Yeah. It really depends on the use case. Like what yeah. are they trying to solve for? But if I were to look at site selection, yeah, I would say, hey, you you need location data, you need demographic data. You need an understanding of that neighborhood that you're looking to uh, open up that st- store in. You might even need migration data, right? To understand if this is an area that is increasing or decreasing yeah. in pop- population. You need to have a lot of real estate data, right? To make sure you have the comps for the different locations that you are looking at. So it's, um, I, I think it's a question of like, how do you make the best uh, lasagna? There's a lot of different ways to make yeah. lasagna, depending on kind of what is what is your uh, your taste. We focus on the location data piece and. I think we try to kind of coach our clients the best and tell them how to take most advantage of that yeah. and what additional sources might be interesting to lay around as well. Okay, so very interesting. So one uh, last thing, I guess, overall from the AI perspective that I wanted to touch on. So overall, I don't know which branch you sort of uh, fall in now from the AI perspective, uh, because the kind of AI that you are talking about, it used to be cool until the times of your generative AI, which is super hot right now, right? So I don't know if you are seeing any sort of use case for generative AI. Obviously, the AI that you are trying to utilize for your use cases is probably not going to be generative AI, but I don't know if you are able to use it to enrich your data, to augment, to do anything from your perspective. Yeah. So touch on that probably. Yeah, so and then uh, I think you're right. Everybody's trying to figure out what is the, how do they take advantage of AI, right? Or how do they take advantage of generative AI? And, and, and one is, of course, like how do you build better products? The customer yeah. doesn't really know that you're leveraging machine learning, algorithms, AI, or et cetera. But one thing that we have seen that is tremendously valuable because we're still kind of trying to figure out all tech companies, where does AI, or generative AI makes the most value? Yeah. And what we have seen that generative AI is really good at is to translate numbers into narratives. Yeah. So what I mean by that, translating numbers into narratives. Yeah. If you take a look at the dashboard yeah. that we have, so you click on the location that you're interested in, you might get 15 different graphs yeah. and stats about that location, everything from foot traffic to demographic data, trade yeah. area, et cetera. It's now a bit overwhelming for you as a store manager to like, what does all these graphs tell me? Like yeah. now you have to decipher the connection hmm. between graph number one and graph yeah. number three and yeah. you have graph no- number five. Yeah. But what generative AI is, is really good at is like take that whole view, yeah. like all that insights huh. and give you the snapshot, give you the conclusion. Wow. Basically, you are now you are now looking at 15, 15 graphs. What you should know about this is X, Y, Z. And that is what we've invested a lot of effort and time into building into our products. So when you click on a location in the Unicast Insights platform, yeah. you get all these graphs so you can kind of dive deeper in, but you also get this executive summary yeah. that tells you the conclusion, is this location a good place for you or not? Mm-hmm. And that saves the analyst or the person working on that hours and hours every week rather than having to kind of stitch all these things together. Yeah. Generative AI is amazing at taking ner- uh, numbers into yeah. narratives, and that is where we have gone all in uh, as the first kind of beachhead for our generative AI strategy. Okay, very interesting. I think we could have gone for hours, but we are close to our time now. So I don't know if you're going to have any sort of closing advice for our listeners. I think if you're starting to use data, like if you're starting to use external data, it's important to kind of first understand what is your first party data sets. Yeah. 
I like understand and kind of capture your own data first and then kind of start to look at how you overlay yeah. with alternative data data sources. Uh, I think that is the recommendation I would give to like retailers that want to become data driven. And when when you kind of have a good view of your first party data, yeah, I think that's the right right time to visit unicast.com and uh, speak to one of us. You are very honest, and that's what I like about you. Thank you so much, uh, yeah. you know, Thomas, for your time. Uh, you know, my personal uh, takeaway from this conversation is going to be if you really want to make money in retail, external data is where the play is. Uh, so if you are not utilizing that, then you have to do it right now. Uh, on that note, thank you so much once again for your time. Really appreciate your insight. Thanks, Sam. Of course. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing the knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you would like to learn more about Thomas, head over to unacast.com. It's U-N-A-C-A-S-T dot com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.